Okay, everybody, good morning. Welcome to Christiansborg, the place of the Danish Parliament. Distinguished guests, dear friends, it's my honor to welcome you all here to the Copenhagen Ukraine Conference 2022. I have, of course, personally looked very much forward for uh, this moment. I'll begin by extending my welcome to the Danish Prime Minister, Mette Frederiksen. Thank you very much, uh, Prime Minister, for participating in our conference. We look forward for your opening remarks in a few moments. And I'll also, of course, like to welcome in this room with uh, great honor Oleksiy Resnikov, the Minister of Defense for Ukraine, who have made his way to Copenhagen during Ukraine's brave and admirable fight against the Russian invaders. And I would, of course, also like to welcome our co-host and our dear friend, Defence Minister for the UK, uh, Ben Wallace. Welcome again to Copenhagen, Ben. It's an honour to have you here again. So uh, we're glad that, uh, that you are here too. Because today, 26 countries around this table will discuss the important and urgent matter of how to further enhance our military assistance to Ukraine. It is countries that have already demonstrated a will to go both above and beyond to provide military assistance to Ukraine. Assistance which has been vital to halt Putin's brutal assault on Ukraine. We are also today joined by the IDCC from Stuttgart. We're glad, of course, for that. And also joined by the European Union, who plays an important role in the uh, international donation coordination. We meet today to reinforce our commitment to Ukraine's defense struggle and to prevent that Putin can succeed with his land grab. To that end, we'll discuss how to enhance our support to Ukraine on different key areas. This includes training activities, common funding for buying weapons intended for Ukraine, increased industrial productions of weapon systems, and as well of demining activities. So once again, everybody, welcome to Copenhagen. Welcome, welcome to uh, the castle of Christiansborg. It's a great honor for us to have you here. But now, first, it is a special honor that we can now welcome the leader of Ukraine's fight against uh, the Russian aggression, President Vladimir Zelensky, who will address us live from Kiev. Dear President, we know that uh, you have a short uh, time and that you are short on time. It is highly appreciated that you have taken your time to address our conference here today. Your capacity as a leader is an inspiration for all of us. Without any more delay, I'll now give the word to His Excellency President Volodymyr Zelensky. The word is yours. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much, dear Premier Minister Fredriksen, dear Minister Bertsko, dear participants, uh, ladies and gentlemen who participate in the conference. I am thankful for organization of such an important event, which is directly, immediately important right now and not only to Ukraine. First of all, I would like to remind you one episode of our shared history. It occurred in Sweden, around 700 kilometers from Copenhagen, a little bit more uh, of one hour flight. One day on the nuclear station Forsmark, the radiation control uh, equipment detected the radiation pollution and then they checked everything swiftly and the leakage of radiation in Forsmark haven't been found but from the other spots in Sweden and also from Finland the message started to appear that they also fixed the increased radiation level and concerns were raised in Denmark as well where they also fixed the 
increased radioactive elements level and it became clear that emergency occurred but they didn't know where exactly after analyzing the character of pollution the direction of and speed of wind they found out that it is somewhere on the territory from Minsk to Black Sea that the catastrophe occurred somewhere there it was April 1986 uh, only one day have passed uh, after the nuclear reactor explosion in Chernobyl, uh, Russian authorities kept silent today and they tried to diminish the scale of the catastrophe, but it was impossible to hide it. It already was known in Europe, uh, they already had proofs for pollution, and the discussion already started how it it's danger to all the people. I won't remind you all the details for these days. I think you all know about it, about the fire on the Chernobyl station and the efforts of those who tried it to localize the catastrophe, about the diagnosis of acute radiation disease and about the people who been in horrible agony were begging for salvation. The significant territories were polluted. Around the Chernobyl, we still have the alienation zone where people are forbidden to live. Hundreds of thousands of uh, inhabitants of different countries have suffered in that or other way from Chernobyl. And yes, of this catastrophe, around all the world, they were thinking how to make it more secure, the nuclear energy. Yes, they've been observing the special standards to guarantee the, that no such catastrophes will occur again. And yes, nobody could even think that Europe can be in, at the face of another catastrophe on the nuclear station, not because of someone violated some security standards, but because of some state consciously will use nuclear station for terror. That's what Russia is doing now. And if Russian, if Soviet authorities try to hide Chernobyl catastrophe and its full consequence, then Russia is even more cynical and even more dangerous. It itself catastrophe would be maximum and it lies to all the world that seemingly someone else is guilty. We need to protect Europe of this threat, we all together and most possible, not only Europe, because Zaporizhia nuclear station is the biggest on our continent. It is the third by its size in the world. Six energy blocks. During the years of its operation, fortunately, there was no incident that could endanger the security of Euro Ukrainians or Europeans. But now Russian occupation army is using Zaporizhia nuclear station for terror and armed provocations. Russia has turned nuclear station on the battlefield. When Russia arrived to Zaporizhia nuclear station, their tanks shelled it. Direct fire on the station by placing combat equipment on the territory of the station and even doing the utilization of the ammunition, Russian military cannot not be aware that they are putting all the Europe under the threat of the nuclear catastrophe. And of course, Russian authority understands which are the aftermath when its army will shell, will fire nuclear station, in particular with reactive artillery. Just recently, they, they damaged the communication lines with our energy systems and also the equipment for energy monitoring, the nitrogen oxygen station, the pipelines of hydrogen and infrastructure. And it, even that day, Europe were just near the nuclear catastrophe. And even now, we are convinced that the trajectory of the cruise, cruise missile, which are used by Russia to fire the Ukraine, is not excellently that it is going through Zaporizhia nuclear state. It's all for Russian nuclear terrorists. Russia is now terrorist state, and it is holding hostage uh, the nuclear station, and it's blackmailing everyone with the nuclear catastrophe. I'm sure that every one of you have thought how to th do if Russia will use tactical nuclear weapon. Think about that one, that Russia can provoke the largest in history radiation emergency in Zaporizhia nuclear station, and the factual aftermath can be even more catastrophic 
than Chernobyl, and by essence, the same as employment by Russia of nuclear weapons, but without actual nuclear strike. Nobody could stop wind if it will care radiation, but all of us together can stop the state terrorist. And the sooner we will stop Russia, the sooner Europe and the world can feel safe. Everyone that we need for this, you all know. Sanctions against Russia needs to be strengthened and without any loopholes. As a response to nuclear blackmail, we need to do, we need to introduce tough sanctions against Rosatom and all the Russian nuclear sector, but not to have agreement with them. We need constant political pressure to Russia to increase the quality of countries, participants of anti-war coalition, and decrease the circle of those who is ready to help Russia in any way in these circumstances. And even more, we need to support Ukraine even more with weapons and ammunition to really stop Russia. You, armed forces of Ukraine need to have as much ammunition as is needed that it would be tangible that Russia is not capable to pressure on the battlefield and weapons to Ukraine should be delivered of such air power and such a range that Russia would be forced to think finally about solution, about the peaceful solution. The Minister of Defense uh, of Ukraine, Alexei Reznikov, who is now present here at the conference, for sure will inform you about the concrete defense needs. The second point is finances. Russia still receives tens of billions of dollars thanks to trade with other countries, including Europe. And in Ukraine, monthly deficit only the state budget is about five billion of dollars. And destruction because of war happening, it's on the our territory of Ukraine, not other country. And we cannot wait when we the war will stop to renew the normal life. Our children, just as your children, have to go to school. Our youth, just as your youth, have to study the university. In Ukraine, just as in your country, we need to have hospitals, we need to have social infrastructure operational, and thus Ukraine needs restructuring right now, immediately. And even more before the winter period, we need to do the mining activities, and of course we need to prepare the defense for the winter conditions, and thus sufficient and timely financial support for our country for budget and for fast recovery. This is the same critical justice weapons and ammunition for our army and sanctions against Russia. And the country who blocks this financing for Ukraine cannot have any justification. It has to remember that it's a European country and it needs to justify this and it to correct this problem immediately. And third point is export to Russia, the delivery to the companies of state terrorist of parts and production of double purpose. Russia wouldn't have any combat capabilities in the modern condition if not imported detail electronics optics and uh, are the very important foreign manufactured parts that used for drones communications armored material as well this flow to the technical system to russian terror needs to be stopped immediately we need to have immediate control mechanisms for any delivery to russia that we would miss any part that could be used to produce armament for shelling peaceful cities or nuclear stations. Ladies and gentlemen, the reaction now should be full scale, just as war which Russian started. Nobody needs new catastrophes. We need to do conclusions out of catastrophe 1986. Uh, out from the decades that Russia were using to prepare for this wild war against the whole free Europe. Out of eight years of war on Donbass, out of 170 days of terror against Ukraine after the 24th of February. No silencing, only truth. No lingering, only decisive actions. No dismay, only resolute resolute unity. We need armament and ammunition for our defense 
to the maximum. We need finances for Ukraine in the necessary, insufficient volume and without any bureaucratic blockages. We need full isolation of terrorist sponsor, most of all economic and technological ones, and the most tough sanctions. It is our responsibility with you before our countries, before all the future generations of the free people to do everything that we could to stop Russia, to provide its defeat in this war and guarantee that no other state could repeat this terror. And I believe that we will fulfill this responsibility. Thank you for attention. Thank you, Denmark and Great Britain for the common organization of this conference that can be historical. It can be historical thanks to our shared efforts. Thank you one more time. Glory to Ukraine. Thank you, Mr. President. We are all honored that you took the time to address us here uh, today. We have listened carefully to your strong uh, words, and I can assure you that you will have the full support from the countries around this table here today. We have come here today to reaffirm our support to uh, Ukraine, and the results of today's conference will be an even stronger commitment for your fight. I can assure you that. So thank you very much again, Mr. President. It was an honor that you took the time to address the conference today. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next speaker is the Danish Prime Minister, Mette Frederiksen. Dear Prime Minister Mette, thank you very much for joining us here today. Since February, Denmark has found it critical, found it critical to support Ukraine in its fight for freedom. In your speech uh, to the uh, Ukrainian parliament in June, you stated that the uh, Ukrainian people is not only fighting for Ukraine, but for free nations all around the world. And that's the, then that the free nations, of course, stands behind Ukraine. And that's, of course, indeed why we're here today as free nations fighting together for Ukraine. We are so glad that you could take your time to be here. Prime Minister, the floor is yours. First of all, I would like to thank President Zelensky for your brave words once again. Your leadership and the courage of the Ukraine people inspires us all. And thank you, all of you, for being here today. I think today is a very clear statement to the historic support for Ukraine on both sides of the Atlantic. And today is important for Ukraine, for Europe, and for the free world. Almost six months have passed since Putin began his brutal and illegal invasion of Ukraine. Six months of war, of destruction, of suffering. Each day, the people of Ukraine have paid an unbearable price for Putin's cruelty. Thousands have died, millions are displaced, families torn apart. The destruction of homes, and lives is beyond belief. Even so, Ukraine fights on. We have all seen the heroic actions of the Ukraine soldiers on Snake Island, in Mariupol, in Kherson, and in many other places in Ukraine where you have fought back at the aggressor, Putin. You are defending your country with skill and courage. Your bravery stands undefeated. Still, you cannot fight this uneven war on your own. We need all of us to continue and to increase our support of Ukraine with weapons, training, demining, financing. I hope that is ready to do our part. Today, we can announce a new contribution of 110 million euro for weapons, equipment, and training. Throughout history, monumental events and periods of time have shaped our world. Of course, two world wars, 
the fall of the Soviet Union, the terrorist attacks on 9-11, and now Russia's war on Ukraine. This is not only a war about land and borders. This is a war of beliefs between freedom and oppression, between democracy and tyranny. It is a war on the values that Europe and the free world is built upon. And that is why we have to ask ourselves, do we have the courage to stand up for our values? Are we ready to defend the rule-based world order? Will we assist our friends in their time of need? The answers to these questions have the power to decide our future. Years from now, my guess will be that our children and grandchildren will look back on our actions. And we must be able to look them in the eyes and say, we did the right thing. We stood firm on our values. And we stood firm on the values that we want to pass on to the future generations democracy, peace, and justice. We, the countries present here today, have made a very important decision to stand up against injustice and to stand behind Ukraine. Today, we will reaffirm this. We reaffirm our commitment to the freedom of Ukraine. And let us make this promise to President Zelensky and to the people of Ukraine. We will not let you down. Once again, welcome to all of you. Thank you for your participation here today in Copenhagen. Good luck with all the decisions we have to make today. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. And again, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Thank you so much. Now it's a very great honor uh, to present our colleague, the Minister of Defense, Ben Wallace. The UK leadership during this crisis has been essential. Thank you so much, Ben, for that. The floor is now yours, Ben. Thank you, Morton, and uh, thank you for Denmark for hosting this uh, important event. It might be the middle of August and for many countries holiday season, but the fact we are all here shows that we're not giving up and that the media reported fatigue is just that, media reported, when in reality we're here to plan for the next steps. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Russia invading illegally a country whose only crime was to choose its own future and to look towards Europe and the values that we all embrace. We wouldn't be here if the Ukrainians hadn't fought. Many, including in the West, thought Ukraine's resistance would be strong, but its ability to hold back the big Russian might of its army would be limited. Russia, Russia has been proved uh, weak. Its international arrogance has been exposed. And indeed, Ukraine fought, and we are now over 150 days in. Not without cost. Brave, brave Ukrainian civilians and brave Ukrainian personnel have sacrificed their lives to protect that country. But I am pleased that Russia's objectives have all to date been unmet. And it is important that we continue to do it. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the support of the United States. Modest, I have to say, at some stage. But actually, the scale of the United States' support to Ukraine has been massive, significant, dwarfs the support the United Kingdom or anyone else has put in, and I want to thank the United States for that. It demonstrates, many of us, what we already know, that without the support of the United States, security in Europe is always at risk. The United States' support for us is the cornerstone of European security, and I want to say thank you to them. And I know the Ukrainians are in equal position. And it wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the support of all of us in this room, big or small, Countries from across the political divide, left wing, right wing, we're all in this room, all agreeing that it's our values and our democracies that are at risk. Across the world, not just neighboring countries, not just European countries, not just NATO, 
but countries from across the Pacific who too recognize that their values, their democracies, their freedoms, their rule of law are also at risk should Russia be successful. And for all that reason, we are where we are six months in and there is hope in Ukraine. There is success on the ground. There is a weaker, isolated Russia. And so far, but only now so far, he has not been victorious. Because he made six assumptions, I think, when he started. Certainly when I went to meet them in the Kremlin and in Moscow, Russia made certain assumptions. One was Ukraine would welcome them with open arms. Often mistakes of previous despots have made about their high opinion of themselves. Or that Ukraine wouldn't fight. That the Russian army was superior and that the international community would not come together. How wrong Putin has been on all those fronts. But he still has two assumptions that he's going to bank on. And actually, they are, to some extent, the most important for all of us and our own populations. One is the assumption that brutality wins. That if all else fails, break the law, break human rights, break countries, attack, rape, murder, destroy. And if you, if you do that, he may calculate that maybe he might win. So throw everything out of the window that we value and proceed that way. And the danger of him winning through brutality is what it sends to all those other people around the world who think that becomes the way to win, not to respect international law and not to respect international human rights. And his last assumption, which is why this room proves him wrong and it must continue to prove wrong by our actions, is that we will all go off on holiday and get tired of this campaign, that the West is flaky, materialistic, and doesn't really care much more than a few more months. And we have to prove that is not correct. And the great thing is, coming to the Danish parliament today, to see all political parties, left or right, in support, to see in my own parliament, all our parties, and across the age gaps. We all thought 17-year-olds were interested in TikTok and social media and weren't so bothered. Ukraine is their fight. Ukraine has used emotion and support and values, and they care about those values as much as their grandparents. And we mustn't let them down. It's their fight, because in all the direction of the world is going, more anxious, more unstable, more insecure, growing China, growing threats in Africa, we have to stick together, and we have to show we won't get tired. And this conference is about concrete measures. Measures that will see Ukraine through, not just tomorrow, next week, and whatever offense is, but next year and the years beyond that. So I hope that all of us will be putting our hands in our pockets, seeing what we can deliver for Ukraine, and helping send a signal around the world that brutality doesn't win, and the international community doesn't get tired. It stands up to its enduring values, no matter what. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben. The next speaker is Defence Minister Oleksiy Resnikov. Oleksiy, you have admired us all with your courage and strength. We are honoured that you are here today and uh, will share this moment with us. We hope for concrete results uh, to help you fight uh, against the Russian invaders. So thank you very much again, Oleksiy, for being here. The floor is yours. Dear colleagues, uh, I'm glad to see very familiar my close friends here again. And to begin with, I would like to thank you everyone for the help that your countries have already extended to Ukraine. We sincerely appreciated it, absolutely. And on the eve of this meeting, we sent uh, you a position document to ensure that everybody understood our line of thought and Ukraine's primary needs in resisting Russian aggression. It has been 169 days since Russia began its full-scale invasion. Ukraine is fighting, and our goal has not changed. It is to restore our nation's territorial integrity and sovereignty within its internationally recognized borders. For that, we need to stop the enemy, 
stabilize the front line, which is over 2,500 kilometers. It means 1,500 miles long. And active combat is ongoing along the stretch over 1,300 1, kilometers. And prepare a counter-offensive operation. Within this context, we have defined couple groups of priority capabilities that the armed forces of Ukraine need to succeed. They include strengthening anti-access and area denial capabilities to secure the northwest part of the Black Sea, ensuring air defense for major cities and critical infrastructure objects, protection of the border with the Belarus, and also concrete capabilities that we need to stabilize the front line and create conditions for counter-offensive operations. I would also like to add a couple of words about something of no less importance. I mean leadership and coordination. We are very realistic in our position. Russia is a dangerous opponent who accepts no rules and has giant resources. It is a terrorist state with a no respect for human lives and no fear of casualties. It has been committing mass killing of prisoners of war and civilians. It has used disinformation, migrants, grain, energy, and nuclear blackmail as the weapons. Their tactics are a threat to us all. Russia wants to impose its view of the world order based not on law and humanist values, but brute force. Russia is used to threatening its opponent and raising the stakes. Indeed, the civilized world would always back down and offer compromises. Nevertheless, more people began to acknowledge that Russians' words and agreements with them are not worth the paper they are written on. So that could be due. The solution is obvious. Russia succeeds then it managed to divide us when it confront, confronts us one-on-one, -on -one, pulling together its resources and beating us. Russia is defeated and backed down when it loses the initiative, meets with the coordinated resistance, and has to spread its resources. That is why I would like to personally thank my colleagues and friends of Ukraine, Morten Botsko and Ben Wallace, for their leadership they have been demonstrating not just today, but during all these months. I would like also to thank the great friend to Ukraine, Secretary Lloyd Austin, for the United States leadership and his personal efforts, including those in the Rammstein format. This format is unique in the contemporary world. Russia didn't expect this. Thanks to this leadership and, his, and the coordinated efforts of many nations, Ukraine received assistance that allowed our soldier to surprise Russians on the battlefield on land, on the sea, and in the air. The terrorist state did not meet its goal because many countries have contributed to the resistance, and very contribution mattered. Any effort that stops Russia from throwing its every resource at Ukraine is of valuable help to us. When you conduct military exercises, the Kremlin must consider that. That saves Ukrainian lives. Sweden. Finland, Canada, Denmark supported the training for Ukrainian soldiers launched in the UK. This is what Russia fears. When the Kremlin sees that the free world can act fast and coordinate its efforts across the entire front from Svalbard to the Black Sea, it must recognize that it has lost the initiative. The Ukrainian army has already destroyed a significant portion of Russian's allied troops its paratroopers, marines, and special operation forces. There is something that the Russian cities of Murmansk, Kaliningrad, and Pskov have in common now. Their cemeteries are growing fast. Our resistance has already changed the situation in the North and the Baltic region. Russia now has the smaller capabilities for pressure. These things are directly interconnected. Our coordinated efforts can make entire Europe, including the Baltic nations, safe. 
Ukrainian is eager to its part, but we need instruments. The sooner we get them and the larger cap cap capacities we get, the sooner we reach our shared goal of a peaceful Europe and the lower the cost. Thank you for your attention. Slava Ukraine. Thank you, Alexei. We have listened carefully to your wise words, and uh, we look forward, of course, to the discussions of uh, your insights here uh, today. And everybody, as you all can hear, there are many challenges ahead of us, and uh, indeed much uh, to discuss here uh, today. And this concludes the part of the conference open for uh, the press, and we'll have a press conference uh, after the conference. Delegations, please remain uh, seated while the press leave the room, and uh, we'll follow shortly after that. <laughs>